The Game of Thrones Season 7 finale begins with Daenerys' army arriving at King's Landing. This is as close as Danny has ever come to her goal of the Iron Throne. She could probably swoop in and take it now, but she's holding off in the hopes of a truce. In her vision in Season 2, Danny approaches the throne and reaches for it, but doesn't take it. Maybe this suggests that Danny will never win the throne. Jamie and Bronn watch from above and talk about the meaning of life. Is it gold? Family? Cox? Bronn is one of the only characters in Thrones who's actually better off now than he was in Season 1. He's made money, been knighted, got people calling him my lord, while so many others have lost loved ones, or lost their heads, or their hands, or their cocks. Jon Snow also arrives at King's Landing. When his uncle Ned came to this city, he died. When Ned's father and brother came to this city, they died too. The Starks are never comfortable in the crowded capital. Jamie once said that Starks are made of ice, and when they come south, they melt. But as we soon learn, John is more than just a Stark. The groups meet in the ruins of the Dragon Pit. The Dragon Pit was built a few hundred years ago as a sort of a stable for the Targaryen dragons. But as Daenerys learned in Marine, dragons don't like captivity. Over the years, the pit dragons grew smaller and stunted, which reflects the slow decline of the Targaryen dynasty. It also reflects the nature of magic in Game of Thrones. Magic is wild and uncontrollable, a sword with no hilt. If you lock a dragon in a box, it'll waste away, but if you let it loose, it'll eat people, so there's no safe way to use it. Which is why some people think that the maesters of the Citadel may have deliberately killed off the dragons as part of a conspiracy against magic. Go watch that video. But everyone comes together in the biggest meeting of characters ever. Tyrion reunites with Bronn and Pod, who have both saved his life in the past. Brienne and the Hound talk about Arya like proud soccer mums, even though Brienne almost killed Sandor once. Other reunions aren't so happy. Tyrion sees his sister Cersei after he killed their father Tywin. Daenerys meets Jaime, who killed her father Aerys. Theon sees Euron, who captured his sister Yara. And Jon meets Cersei, who helped kill his uncle Ned. There's also this awkward love square between Brienne, Jaime, Cersei, and Euron, so all of this history makes for a very tense scene. Bronn leaves early with Pod. Tyrion had just offered Bronn gold if he changes sides, and Bronn always said he looks after himself and doesn't want to risk his life fighting dragons. So it looks likely that Bronn will leave Cersei and maybe join Daenerys. But another possible reason why Bronn leaves is that there's apparently drama between Bronn's actor and Cersei's actress, and they don't want to be in the same scenes. The Hound threatens the mountain, which all but confirms Cleganebowl, the idea that these brothers will fight to the death in the greatest grudge match in Westeros. Sandor has always wanted to kill his brother. They fought once in Season 1, and it looks like they'll fight a final time in Season 8. Since Gregor is now some kind of zombie, the Hound might need to use fire to kill him which might allow Sandor to get over his fear of fire, which he got from Gregor burning his face in the first place. So Cleganebowl is kind of silly, but it could give a neat sense of closure to Sandor's story. Daenerys arrives on her dragon. You can tell she's been practicing her impressive entrances. And Euron gets a hungry look, seeing the dragon. There's a whole plot in the books about Euron trying to use a magic horn to steal one of Danny's dragons. Maybe he'll try something similar in the show. Danny apologizes for arriving late and making everyone wait, which is a bit of a meta joke about the fact it's taken Danny seven seasons to join the main plot in Westeros. Tyrion starts a speech, but Euron interrupts and gets all aggressive and threatens to kill Yara, but Cersei shushes him. Cersei might have actually told Euron to do this, because it's useful to remind Danny's side that Cersei has a hostage, but shushing Euron's threat also makes Cersei look cooperative. It's kind of the opposite of how Littlefinger uses Lynn Corbray in Book 4, for those who are keeping score. Jon shows everyone the zombie, which is the first time most of these people have seen a white. Tyrion, Varys, Missandei, Theon, Brienne, Jaime, Cersei, they've all been mostly separate from the supernatural in this story. But now magic and politics come crashing together. Jon explains the threat of the army of the dead. With Kyburn, it's love at first sight, but everyone else is suitably spooked. 
Euron says he'll retreat to the Iron Islands, which is a lie designed by Cersei to make Danny think Euron's out of the picture when he's actually getting more soldiers for Cersei. Cersei says she's convinced and agrees to a peace on one condition. Jon has to swear to stay out of the war between Cersei and Danny. So this is a good strategy from Cersei. She's hoping to take away Danny's greatest ally and let Danny fight the dead while Cersei gathers her strength to later fight a weakened Danny. But Jon refuses Cersei's deal, and Cersei stomps out. Brienne tries to get Jaime to change Cersei's mind, telling him fuck loyalty, which is a neat reversal of their usual dynamic, with oath-keeping Brienne trying to teach honour to Jaime the Kingslayer. But the job of convincing Cersei falls to the man who Cersei hates most her brother Tyrion. Cersei starts out hating Tyrion for a lot of the same reasons their father Tywin hated Tyrion, for the death of Tyrion's mother in childbirth, and for Tyrion's mockery of their family pride. But Cersei's hatred of Tyrion grows through the series as he undermines her power, threatens her and her children, and sends Marcella to dawn. In season 4, Cersei accuses Tyrion of killing Joffrey, which he didn't, but then he kills Tywin, and ever since, Cersei's tried to have Tyrion killed. Cersei accuses him of wanting to destroy their family, even though Cersei has killed more Lannisters than Tyrion has. She blew up Uncle Kevin and Cousin Lancel. It's true that the murder of Tywin was a huge blow to House Lannister, but at least in the beginning it wasn't Tyrion's goal to destroy his family. He loved Jaime, and he loved Marcella and Tommen, and deep down Cersei must know this, because when Tyrion tells her to kill him, she doesn't. Maybe she only wants to keep him alive to make this peace deal. But Cersei says she doesn't care about the world, doesn't care about anyone but herself and the people she loves. Tyrion works out that she's pregnant, the scene ends, and then they make the peace deal. So we don't know exactly what happens here, but it seems Cersei uses her pregnancy to show that she's got something to lose, to make Cersei more believable when she says she'll make peace. It's similar to when Cersei used her pregnancy to assure Jaime's loyalty. She's using her body as a strategic tool. As Cersei once said, a woman's weapon is between her legs. As always, Cersei uses her weapon to protect her power and her pride. Some people think that Tyrion might have offered Cersei something to convince her to make peace, like maybe that her child would be the heir to the throne or something. But does Cersei have much leverage in this situation anyway? It's in her interests to make peace, even if she gets nothing in return. So there may not have been a secret deal here between Cersei and Tyrion. At the Dragon Pit, Danny tells Jon that Miri Mazdur said that Danny can't have children, and Jon suggests that Miri might have been wrong. They keep on bringing up Danny's fertility. Maybe she can have kids now. Maybe she always could, and Dario was just shooting blanks. It could solve this whole succession problem if Danny has a kid with Jon. And a pregnancy could also suggest that Danny might actually survive this series, at least for another nine months. Cersei declares that she'll make peace with Danny and fight with her against the dead, but later we learn it was all a lie, and Cersei will let Danny go north while she stays south and gathers her strength. Jamie argues that they need to go help defeat the dead, and that they won't defeat Danny in the long run anyway. Cersei points out that Danny has lost a dragon, which means that she can be beat and she reveals that she sent Euron to Essos to hire a mercenary group called the Golden Company, using the gold from Highgarden. In the books, the Golden Company has a long history, and they're involved in Varys' complex conspiracy. Go watch that video. That sort of stuff won't be in the show, but they do have Oliphants, so that'll be dope. Point is, with the help of the Golden Company, Cersei hopes to defeat Danny when she returns from fighting the dead. But Jaime's mad. He's mad that Cersei didn't tell him her plan. He's mad that she's talking about marrying Euron, and most of all, he's mad about being forced to break his word to help Danny. Because all his life, Jaime's been hated for killing the king he swore to protect, Aerys Targaryen. Now, Jaime wants to ride with Aerys' daughter and restore his honour, do something selfless for once. Jaime stood by Cersei when she tried to kill his brother Tyrion. He stood by her when she killed Jaime's uncle and cousin and hundreds of innocents. But now Jamie realises he can't be with Cersei and become the person he wants to be. And so, he leaves. Jamie rides north. Instead of rich gold Lannister armour, he wears black and rides a black horse, maybe hinting he could join the Night's Watch someday. But Jamie's final fate may be back at the capital. He and Cersei often say that they'll die together, 
Watch the Cersei video to see how that might end. As Jamie rides, snow falls on King's Landing. Winter is here. Up at Winterfell, Littlefinger leads Sansa to believe that Arya wants to kill Sansa and become Lady of Winterfell, which Arya herself kinda hinted last episode. And Sansa seems to believe Peter, but later she teams up with Arya and turns against him. So what changed? Some people think that Sansa and Arya had been secretly working together all along, that these arguments they had last episode were staged under the assumption that Littlefinger would spy on them, so he would think his plan to divide the sisters was working while they actually plotted against him. But this idea isn't really supported by the show. It's not clear what Sansa would gain by leading Peter along. There's no evidence that Peter would have heard these multiple private conversations. And if Peter was a good enough spy to see these, wouldn't he have also heard their real plans? An interview with Bran's actor suggests that these Santa Aya scenes were real, but at some later point Santa asked Bran for help and he told her that Littlefinger misled them. And only then did Santa team up with Aya against Peter. So there was no complex hidden plot. The Starks were just really slow to work out that Littlefinger was playing them. Even though Sansa already knew Littlefinger's been playing her, and even though Arya is a highly trained spy and lie detector, and even though Bran knows everything, so this whole plot was a pretty huge fail from the Stark siblings. But they now realise that Peter is their enemy, and accuse him of his crimes. Killing Lysa, conspiring to kill Jon Arryn, lying about this dagger to cause war, betraying Ned, and giving Sansa to the Boltons. Littlefinger falls to pieces, and totally fails to defend himself, even though he probably could, The Starks have no hard evidence of Peter's crimes, apart from the word of a crippled boy who claims to be psychic. Surely the master schemer Peter could talk his way out of this, just like he talked his way out of Lysa's murder in the first place. But he breaks down when he sees Sansa set against him. He loves her so much, in his own creepy way, that he just cannot deal with her against him, and so he's killed by Arya, with the same blade Peter used to start this whole war in season one. Catelyn once said that Peter is clever, but not wise. He was clever enough to trick Sansa and Arya, clever enough to cause a whole war, but not wise enough to see that his obsession with Sansa was his blind spot and his downfall. And now Sansa has finally freed herself of his control. All series she's been a pawn of Cersei, the Tyrells, Peter, Ramsay. But as Peter says, even the humblest pieces can have wills of their own. Sansa has learned from the people who controlled her, and freed herself at last. She's her own person now, with her own power. We'll see next season how she chooses to use it. We also get a scene of Arya and Sansa being friends again. Sansa quotes Ned, saying, When the snows fall and the white winds blow, the lone wolf dies, but the pack survives. Stark's gotta stick together. Might have been better advice if Ned said, hey, if you're thinking of murdering your sister, ask your psychic brother first to check if you're being little-fingered, but it did work out in the end. The Starks are united. At Dragonstone, Theon tells Jon about how he felt growing up at Winterfell. He felt torn between his Greyjoy identity and wanting to be a part of the Stark family, and that conflict led Theon to commit his crimes, betraying the Starks, capturing Winterfell, killing Roderick, killing innocent kids... He has suffered for his crimes, Ramsay saw to that, and he's tried to redeem himself by saving Sansa, but he still feels guilt and feels torn between Greyjoy and Stark. So Jon gives Theon the forgiveness and the acceptance that he needs, says that Theon can be both a Greyjoy and a Stark. So with his character conflict fixed by a Bequena Los Dos, Theon sets off to save his sister Yara. But first, he has to win over his Ironborn crew, and he does it the way Ironborn do. Violence. On the one hand, it might feel kind of cheap for Theon's long and complex character arc to climax with a fist fight. But on the other hand, this scene really does capture the meaning of Theon's Greyjoy identity. He gets beaten down and defeated, but then he rises again, harder and stronger. No matter how bad he suffered, how bad he fucked up, he can survive and persist and succeed. After the fight, Theon baptizes himself with salt water, born again like he was in season two. But this new identity he's forged is stronger than before. He gathers his 20 good men and sets off to save his sister. Sam arrives at Winterfell and meets with Bran, who he helped through the wall back in season three. 
Brant says he remembers everything, and he confirms the biggest oldest secret in Game of Thrones, that Jon Snow is the child of Rhaegar Targaryen and Lyanna Stark. Rhaegar is Daenerys' brother, and Lyanna is Ned's sister. Twenty years before the main story, Rhaegar ran off with Lyanna, even though Rhaegar was married to Elia Martell, and Lyanna was promised to marry Robert Baratheon. So Robert started a war against the Targaryens, killing Rhaegar, usurping King Aerys, and making himself king. Lyanna died giving birth in Dawn, and Ned Stark came home with baby Jon Snow and claimed Jon was his bastard in order to protect Jon, because Robert would have killed him if he knew he was the son of a Targaryen. So that's the R plus L equals J theory, and readers have known about this for years, but Sam says something that not even Bran knew, that Rhaegar annulled his marriage to Elia Martell and secretly married Lyanna, meaning that Jon is not a bastard, but a legitimate child of Prince Rhaegar, which means Jon's the rightful heir to the Iron Throne, ahead of Daenerys. A lot of readers suspected this too. There are heaps of hints in the books that Jon would be king, and people have speculated for years about a secret marriage. One idea was that they would be married on the Isle of Faces, because that's near where Lyanna met Rhaegar, and it has a bunch of weirwood trees. Weirwoods are used in northern marriage ceremonies, and greenseers like Bran can see through weirwoods for their visions, so maybe this will be how we learn of the marriage in the books. But this idea of annulment raises questions. In the books, it seems as though you can only annul a marriage if it's unconsummated, if the husband and wife haven't had sex. Rhaegar and Elia had two kids, so could their marriage be annulled? Maybe in the books, Rhaegar will just marry Lyanna in addition to Elia. The Targaryens do have a history of polygamy. But another weird twist is that Jon Snow's real name is apparently Aegon Targaryen. Aegon is a popular name because it's the name of the Conqueror, who first took over Westeros and founded the Targaryen dynasty. But the weird thing is that one of Rhaegar's other children by his first wife Elia is also named Aegon. So Rhaegar's three children are named Rhaenys, Aegon, and Aegon. Why? One possible reason is that Rhaegar seemed to be naming his children after Aegon the Conqueror and his two sisters, Rhaenys and Visenya. Rhaegar was really into prophecy, and thought his first son Aegon would be Azor Ahai, maybe with his two other children, Rhaenys and Visenya, forming the three heads of the dragon, another prophetic thing. Point is, he might have expected his child with Lyanna to be a daughter, and to name her Visenya, but when Rhaegar died and Jon turned out to be male, Lyanna would have to come up with a new name, and by that time, Rhaegar's first son Aegon was dead, so Lyanna might as well name this new kid Aegon, for the Conqueror, and maybe to commemorate the dead Aegon. But it might still be a different name in the books. Some people think Jon will be called Aemon, as a parallel to Jon's mentor and ancestor, Maester Aemon. Or maybe Jaehaerys, one of the better Targaryen kings, whose name starts with the same letter as Jon. But they say a blue winter rose by any other name still smells as sweet. So maybe the name is unimportant. What matters is that Jon is half Stark and half Targaryen. Which connects nicely to what Jon told Theon earlier. That just as Theon can be a Stark and a Greyjoy, Jon can be a Stark and a Targaryen. We also get our first glimpse of Jon's father, Rhaegar Targaryen. He's perhaps not as pretty as he's described in the books, but he does look a lot like his brother Viserys. Maybe Viserys was imitating his brother's look. Bran explains that Rhaegar and Lyanna were in love. Rhaegar didn't kidnap and rape her, like Robert Baratheon claimed. And so, Bran says, Robert's rebellion was based on a lie. Which might not be strictly true. Rhaegar and Lyanna weren't the only cause of the war. You could argue it really began when King Aerys killed Rickard and Brandon Stark, and demanded the heads of Robert and Ned. But still, this misunderstanding adds tragedy to Lyanna and Rhaegar's relationship. Star-crossed lovers from opposing houses, who both died young. But before we get too rosy-eyed about it, remember we still know almost nothing about Lyanna and Elia's perspectives here. It sure looks like Elia was screwed over by her husband Rhaegar, and that Lyanna was a teenager who Rhaegar locked in a tower and used to produce a prophecy baby. So, in the books at least, there's still a lot to be explored about these relationships. While Jon's cousin Bran explains Jon's parents, Jon has sex with his aunt Daenerys, which is a whole lot of weird layers of incest. Tyrion listens outside and looks concerned. 
He might be a bit jealous of John, everyone's kind of in love with Daenerys, but he might also worry that romance between Danny and John could complicate the political situation. As Amon once said, what is honour compared to a woman's love? If you're in love with someone, you might make decisions based on what's best for them instead of what's best for the kingdom. In Book 5, Barrison thinks of all the loves throughout history that have caused conflict, including Rhaegar and Lyanna's. So maybe Tyrion sees that Jon and Danny's relationship could be destructive. But, as Rhaegar knew, you can't fulfil a prophecy of ice and fire to save the world without breaking a few eggs. At Eastwatch, Tormund and Beric chill on the wall when the Night King arrives with his army, and with his dragon. Viserion breathes blue fire on the icy wall, and it starts to crack. The wall has stood for some 8,000 years. Built by the first men, children, and giants to protect the living from the dead, it's one of the hinges of the world. In Book 1, Jon thinks if the wall falls, the world falls with it. And now, the wall falls. There is nothing between the army of the dead and Westeros. The fact that the Night King uses Viserion to take down the wall supports the idea that the lake scene last episode was a trap to take Danny's dragons, because otherwise the Night King was marching on Eastwatch with no apparent plan to pass the wall. So maybe the Night King, like Bran, is some kind of green seer who can have visions of the future and past. His power must be limited. He'd win all the time if he knew everything, but this definitely makes the Night King even more dangerous. Some people think that Bran and the Night King are the same person, like that Bran went back in time and walked into this guy who became the Night King and lived as a white walker for thousands of years and is now battling the past version of himself, which might help explain the psychic connection between the two. It's a fun idea, but there's no real evidence, and it'd require a level of time travel fuckery that might not really fit the story of Thrones as we know it, so it's a cool idea, but it doesn't seem likely. Finally, some people are worried that Beric and Tormund might have died here, but it looks like they run to safety along the wall. Beric's been talking about destiny so much that there's no way he's dying off screen, and Tormund's got to survive to make giant blonde babies with Brienne, right? So they'll probably be back in season 8. But who else will? Game of Thrones Season 7 killed the Freys, the Sand Snakes, the Tarleys, Elena, Thoros, Benjen, and Littlefinger. So basically all the Lords of the South are dead, along with some other loose ends. This lets Season 8 focus on the main conflicts further north, between Cersei and Daenerys, and between the living and the dead. Almost all the named characters are in the north or heading there. The Starks, Sansa, Arya, and Bran, the Northern Lords like Lyanna, Brienne and Podrick, Sam and Gilly, Davos, Gendry, and the Hound, Dolorous Ed with the Night's Watch, Beric and Tormund at Eastwatch, and Danny's crew, Tyrion, Varys, Joram, Asandai, Grey Worm with the Unsullied, and the Dothraki, Jaime, and probably Bronn. All who's left south with Cersei is Kyburn and the Mountain. Euron's heading to Essos to get the Golden Company with the help of the Iron Bank, and Theon's out to save Yara, who might be at the Iron Islands with Aeron, or travelling with Euron maybe. And Melisandre is in Volantis, maybe with some other red priests. She said that she'd return. There are others who we might see again. There's Mira in the Neck, the Maesters at Old Town, and Robin Arryn, who rules the Vale, represented in the North by Bronze Yon Royce. We don't know what's happening in the Riverlands, but maybe we'll see Edmure again? The Reach, Stormlands, and Dawn are a big question mark. Maybe Cersei will take them all back while Danny's gone. We probably won't see Ilaria, or Dario, or Illyrio, or Quaithe. We'll hopefully see Ghost. But what this basically comes down to is all these people in the North against the dead, and against Queen Cersei. The time is done for complicated politics, for whole episodes devoted to walking and talking. The show has just six episodes left to give satisfying ends to all these character arcs, to answer big mysteries like Azor High to decide who'll live and who'll die, and to bring an end to the Song of Ice and Fire. Thanks for watching this video and this series. Alt Shift X is now taking a break. The Patreon is paused, but we will be back with more videos analysing the Game of Thrones books and show. We can also do other series. You want Westworld, Stranger Things, American Gods? Comment below what you want to see. There might also be a kind of book club, livestream, podcast type thing coming, 
And there is also the season finale of Alt Swift Exxon soon, though that's honestly best avoided. But yeah, lots more coming from Alt Shift X in the near future. Thank you to everyone who helps make the Thrones community great. Go check out Radio Westeros, History of Westeros, the subreddits, podcasts, YouTubers, Twitterers, Tumblrites, translators, the artists, Amok, Otach Altanoz, Aruki Saki, everyone. There is heaps of great content out there. Some links are below. Finally, thank you to the patrons, including Vineyard Dog, Cameron Weiss, Reverend Zandria, Mariam Essa, Michael Appel, Jason Rattray, Alex Kirkendall, Ryan Steele, Eric Lewis Dreyfus, The Stevie Franchise, Triangle Wine Company, AB3, Harry, I Love Mondays, Neil Choptekar, Owen C.K., Fred Petty, Lightcraft Miniature Studios, David Howe, Matthew Elisha Williams, Jake Berling, Chris Amos, Chris Cole, Craig Riley, Bobby Eels, Patrick Loring Scogland, Hank Lero, Clayton Anstein, Zach Gordon, Gina Penny, Kara Shutter, Valentin Deegan, Disco Dan, Jesse Deal, Hairless Oyster, Rick. Gay Holmberg, Stephanie Morris, Brandon Winslow, Ad Valenciano, Shiera Seastar, Aliopolo, Cardinal Doomsday, Cata Ernest, and everyone else who supports Alt Shift X. Cheers. <laughs>